Heyo, welcome into the CHGO White Sox podcast presented by DraftKings Sportsbook, America's top rated sportsbook. Download the app and use promo code CHGO when you sign up. Welcome into Studio A of our CHGO offices here in the West Loop of Chicago. The White Sox have a new manager, reportedly. I'm Sean Anderson. You can follow me on Twitter at Sean underscore W underscore Anderson. And we have a full house. We have the regular CHGO White Sox crew, but we also have a guest from left to right. We'll go Vinny Duber. You can follow him on Twitter at Vinny Duber. He's our CHGO White Sox beat writer. To the right of him is Josh <laughs> Nelson of Sox Machine. You can follow Josh on Twitter at Sox Machine underscore Josh. And the man to the left of me is Herb Lawrence. Hello. You can follow him on Twitter at Ecknerwall23. He's our CHGO White Sox community leader. And again, I'm Sean Anderson. Your new White Sox manager is Pedro Griefel of the Kansas City Royals organization. I said yesterday I thought it would be stupid if the White Sox hired Pedro Griefel after the Royals hired Matt Quicharo. After I've heard more reason. That's strike three, right? Yes, that's yeah. strike three. <laughs> that's strike three. <laughs> guys, see you later. Uh, this whole offseason, yeah. I'll yeah. leave you guys with a question. Um, <laughs> thoughts on Pedro Griefel? <laughs> and he gone. <laughs> I, that, so know, that was, no, to, to, to catch anybody up who missed. Sean uh, said it was going to be Joe Spada. It was not. Sean said it was going to be Matt Quattraro. Mm -hmm. It was not. And he said it was not going to be Pedro Griefall. So there you go. One, two, three strikes, you're out. To be fair, I also said it wasn't going to be Ozzie Guillen. You got that so, one. Okay, right. so, so you struck swing. you struck you struck out on a uh, uh, one, one, one two count. There you go. I think that Pedro Griefall, like as Sean said yesterday, and he was alluding to yesterday, why would the Royals have somebody in their office for the last what nine, ten seasons? and not promote him immediately to the manager spot. Pass him over for a guy outside the organization. I've been since, uh, people have been telling me that they made a mistake. They did like the White Sox did with Tony La Russa, where somebody in that organization went over the head of Dayton Moore and said, eh, we want to have this, uh, this other St. Louis guy, Mike Matheny, here as our manager for Kansas City. And so they passed over Griefall, so he became the bench manager there. I've only heard great things for, from the people I know who are baseball people. They tell me just in DMs, like, this is a guy, this is a home run hit hire right here, Herb. You know, he's got what a spotter has and personality. Yeah, he doesn't have the championship caliber team that he comes from, but you're going to love this man. And so I've listened to a couple podcasts that he's been on. He sounds similar to what Espada sounds like. And I like the things he's uh, espousing where he's marrying the analytics side and the gut feeling side and getting people like Ned Yost to finally do things a little bit more progressively and under, like getting that, uh, uh, like that information to him in a digestible uh, bite for an older gentleman to accept and say, okay, I can do that. So initially I was out because of the Kansas City Royals rejecting him, but now I'm good for it. Yeah, with the, the Royals rejecting, the whole situation in Kansas City, though, sounds like since they fired Dane Moore, they wanted someone from the outside to come into the clubhouse and organization with Kansas City. Sounds that's familiar. Very familiar. <laughs> and that's exactly what the White Sox wanted to do. To add on to what you said, Herbie, Pedro Griffel, since 2013, has been part of the Royals organization, and he's been helping the Royals plan against the Chicago White Sox. He knows this roster because he's helped with the pre-gaming and the decision-making going into those games against the White Sox. In the last two years, the Royals have a winning record against the Chicago White Sox, or 20 and 18. So be able to take that knowledge from a Kansas City perspective and outside knowledge about a roster that he's very familiar with because he's had the game plan so often against the White Sox, I am cautiously optimistic about this hire, Vinny. And I think for a lot of White Sox fans, they wanted somebody that wasn't insular. They didn't want somebody that was within the White Sox family. And I think the hiring of Pedro Griffel hits those marks. Well, I'll say this. We, we've, we've talked so much about the criteria that Rick Hahn laid out in his end-of-season press conference. And certainly it seemed like the number one item on that list was 
winning experience, experience winning. Now we're going to get into Pedro Grifol's resume, and that includes some time spent on a coaching staff that won the World Series, uh, however recent you want to consider that. But I think the point being, and Rick Hahn said this on that day, which was we're going to make this list of all the stuff that we want in the ideal candidate, and maybe that a, the person who has all of those things does not exist. And so it might come down to the fact that, yeah, you look at them saying, we want people with winning experience to come from an organization that's contended from championships. And maybe in your opinion, that this doesn't meet that qualification. The Royals, since 2015, when they won the World Series, have not ever had a winning record, have not had a winning record mm-hmm. in, in any season since. They've had one 500 record, 200 lost seasons. They lost 97 games this past year. Not good. Very Royalsy, if you will. But uh, I think the point being that maybe he, maybe Pedro Grifol uh, uh, far and away meets the criteria of being a good communicator, meets the cri- criteria of not having any White Sox DNA, meets the criteria of being somebody who can bring new ideas and a fresh perspective to this organization, meets the uh, criteria of somebody who uh, kind of blends the new school with the old school. If every other item on that list is a thumbs up, for Pedro Grifol, maybe that's why he got this job, even if he doesn't meet that, uh, you know, being part of a winning team, which, by the way, is no fault of his own, you know, that, that right. he was employed by a team that didn't win a whole lot. Uh, but certainly he seemed to impress the folks in Kansas City, and he obviously impressed the folks, the decision makers on the south side, enough to reportedly get this job. And, and you know Vinny very well covering these games. The two things that I've always admired about Kansas City is how hard that they play and how well they play defensively. And how they're able to get that base hit that lands somehow right in shallow (laughs) center field, right beyond the infield, but right in front of the center fielder. Yeah, the Kansas City special that Hawk Harrelson would coin. (laughs) And those two attributes, playing hard and playing better defense, Herbie, man, Mm -hmm. this White Sox organization needs a lot of that. 100% they need all of that. I just, if you can give Pedro Grayfall can get this type of effort out of the White Sox, I know they don't have the speedsters that Kansas City has where they're going mm-hmm. first to third on a on a dime, but maybe that mentality will carry over. And, you know, we have more news carrying over from the Pedro Griefall hiring, the reported hiring, but I just want the team to play smarter. And defense is part of that. Going from first to third uh, selectively is part of that. And if we're going to play more Royals baseball with better talent, I'm in. Let's go. Or Cleveland Guardians baseball with better talent. Sign me up. Well, I, and the one thing that separates, you know, Griefo from the organization that he's coming from is money and talent. The White Sox just sent had a top 10 payroll in baseball. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, the uh, influx of money that he will see will be able to help him and his staff out. And then, obviously, talent. I mean, Kansas City is very young. That's why they went up with Quicharo and the, the change in uh, – uh, GM uh, there obviously makes that, that that change easy, but you mentioned the Royals' record versus the Sox since 2013, 84 and 97. Uh, or sorry, that's the Sox record versus the Royals, um, and the Sox have only had three so many wins. games. I know, right? <laughs> um, they played the Royals I'm, so much. I'm glad we're done playing the Royals so much. <laughs> and the Sox have only had three winning seasons versus Kansas City: 2017, where they were 10 and 9; 2018, 11 and 8; and then the only dominant one, 2020, but it's only 10 games where they went nine and one. Domination. So um, if it. we Go to Vinny's article where he asks, the first question is, who? Um, We can go into the Pedro Grifo resume to let you know where he's come from, what some of that experience is, is, and uh, what or how this experience could help him. Uh, He was named to the U.S. Baseball National Team in 1987-1989. He was the Florida State High School Player of the Year. Or just the High Player of the Year as well, right there. That's High Player of the Year. Oh, High High Player of the Year. year. That's fine. (laughs) That's me. Uh, uh, Just missing a word right there. Uh, 1989 to 1991, uh, he played at Florida State University, went to two College World Series there, and was also an All-American in 1991. From 2000 to 2005, was an area scout for South Florida and Cuban regions for the uh, Mariners organization. From 2003 to 2005, he was the manager of the Everett Aqua Sox. Felix Hernandez was a player under him. Uh, also, Brian Leher, who was an all-star. Great club logo, club. too, if I remember correctly. Isn't it a tree frog? We got we to pull that up. I Former have no club idea. Great. What Brian an Lahair. Aqua Sox is. What's that? Former Cub great, Brian Lahair. Yes, yeah. all-star. I immediately went out to the Cubs guys and was like, he, he coached an all-star. Mm-hmm. Um, 2006 to 2008, coordinator of instruction for the Mariners. 2008 to 2011, director of minor league operations for the Mariners. And then 2010 under Don Wakamatsu was a major league coach with the Seattle team. And there's the Everett He Aqua must Sox. not have been high, but that damn frog is. Yeah, that, that high. <laughs> it, it is wa- Everett's Washington, right? Yes. Yeah. So, yes. 
it's legal out there. Um, it's, it's probably all over the trees. <laughs> That's no. a great logo. It's in, a tremendous logo. In that whole list you have there, you uh, that's mostly his early playing days to his coaching career. I th- want to look at the playing career because he played with a couple people in the Minnesota uh, Twins system back in the day. Pat Mahomes, not the quarterback, not Sean, not a uh, Stephen Alexander's guy, <laughs> Stephen Nicholas guy. You for, you missed it last year. I, I called him Stephen Alexander. Um, it was it was terrible. Um, not the quarterback. His dad was in the Minnesota Twins system and White Sox uh, minor league. I think his uh, the draft guru Mike Shirley was in the Twins uh, system too. With Pedro Griefall play with him too. So he has history. Maybe Mike Shirley gave a good word. He's like, hey man, he sucked as a hitter, but maybe he understands how he how to do things uh, as f- as far as you know. They say that if you can't do teach. Maybe he's a good teacher. Well, Chris Getz and Pedro Griffol cross paths. Uh, Chris Getz was oh, yeah. part of the minor league operations for Kansas City, while Griffol was part of the coaching staff. So there's that type of connection. Again, the White Sox, as far as the decision making, and from a White Sox fan perspective and what the conversation is, it quickly <laughs> goes from who's Pedro Griffol? Okay, well, why didn't Kansas City hire him? You explain that. Okay, well, why didn't they hire Ozzy? Or why they didn't hire Joe Espada? <laughs> We don't know if Pedro Griefel was the White Sox number one choice. Maybe Joe Espada was, or somebody else was the number one choice, and then they became unavailable during the interview process. Or in the interview process, they were number one, and after some conversations, they find out this isn't a really good fit. Mm -hmm. Those are some questions that hopefully we'll get some additional insight during the press conference as the White Sox introduced Pedro Griefel, but... For White Sox fans right now, I, I'm, I'm preaching keep an open mind here because everyone involved is going to be learning on what Pedro Griefel brings to the organization. The thing about Ozzy is we knew what he was going to be bringing into the organization. He makes it very clear on what he was going to be bringing into the organization. And he still will make it very clear as the pre- and post-game host for NBC Sports Chicago. So it's not like Ozzy is leaving uh, the, the White Sox circle as far as their broadcast. He'll still be around and will still get his additional insight. But I, I'm curious here, Vinny, like when you are part of that, well, maybe if you before it happens on your honeymoon trip, like what are some of the questions that you're thinking of right now that you would ask Rick Hahn about like the process of the White Sox finding and then deciding that Pedro Griefel is the best option for us at manager. Well, I'll say this. The, uh, first of all, uh, we don't often get a lot of insight from what went on behind closed doors. The, the White Sox are uh, usually uh, not super forthcoming with that, and that's their prerogative, of course. Uh, but the thing I think that you'd like to know is you were looking for new ideas. You were looking for fresh perspectives. Mm-hmm. You were looking for things that you didn't already have or you didn't already know. What are those things that you now have? And I think, you know, it's one thing for us to just look at the resume and say, okay, well, you were part of a Royals team that uh, uh, seemed to do pretty well against the White Sox. Seems you would have some insight into what some of the issues are on this team and how to exploit some of the issues. Maybe you can plug some of those holes. Uh, But I think just in general, we we heard so often last year from, from the players that the environment in the clubhouse was a good one. That 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 Tony La Russa preached a, a family atmosphere that they all bought into, and and I think the, the it comes down to what is going to be different in the manager's office or, or coming out of the manager's mouth that is going to make put this team in a better position to win. Because Pedro Griefel could be a tremendous, a perfect fit culturally for this team. You know, from a from a leadership standpoint, he could be great. And nothing, none of that is going to matter if they don't win. Because of right. where this team is, as, as in their in their, if you still want to say that the rebuild is ongoing or in their post rebuild <laughs> life, uh, you know, I'm I'm I saw Sean nearly <laughs> have a heart attack over there when I said that, but I guess my point being that I, I like to define uh, I like to define rebuild differently, like it's not over until you win, yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so my point being that uh, you know they they're in a win now mode. And if Pedro Griefall does not lead them to uh, the type of winning that this organization has rarely seen in the past, this hire will be deemed a failure. And and so I think right now what you want to hear from Rick Hahn is, what does Pedro Griefall do that Tony LaRusso wasn't doing? 
that that Rick Renneria didn't bring, that Miguel Cairo couldn't or, or wasn't bringing at the end of last season. What is different and why is it good? I think well, <laughs> grief. The, I think the issue with at least Cairo is probably it wasn't different enough. Maybe like if we, if we could sure, assume, and that's Ky- and you can say that from outside. Cairo's own comments. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? That he was or, or the players' own comments that he was delivering a similar message just in a different way. What is the different message, or does there need to be a different message? I mean, I think people point to Griefel's, uh, you know, relatively brief but still ex- uh, existing experience as a hitting coach. Uh, you know, and saying, you know, oh. Here's a guy who knows how to hit. You know, let, let's let's bring him in and fix all the offense. Well, he's going to have different responsibilities. You know what I mean? It's, so it's not just as easy as going down the resume and saying this. He did this, so this that means this will happen. I, I want to know what does he bring that is this big different thing? Because the big win here, at least in the minds of Sox fans, seems to be. He's not from inside the White Sox. Right. So what is that very positive difference that he, he brings? He replaced George Brett as the Kansas City Royals hitting coach. He has to be great at hitting. Duh. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, let's look at some of the Royals stuff before we get into that. Because uh, our guy, Zoe, also asked in the comments, uh, who's going to be the White Sox hitting coach? Ooh. Just to aggress. And thank you for the super chat, Zoe. Uh, very much appreciate it. Um, Ethan Katz, there is the report that Ethan Katz will stay on as the pitching coach. Yes. Um, but all the other staff will be removed. Except for the bullpen ca- uh, coach, Kurt Hassler. Uh, Kurt uh, that was a report, I think, uh, probably around like the about two weeks ago or a week ago mm-hmm. that, that Katz and, and Hassler was likely stay f- safe. So that par- the part of the staff is going to stay the same. Um, but the winning experience part that Rick Hahn talked about in his press conference, he comes from the Royals. Yes, they won a World Series. But like we said, the Royals do have some... F- Ugly seasons in there since well, and I'll just quickly point out too, he's won a world. He's been a part of a World Series winner more recently than Ozzie Guillen. Yes, ten years more recently than Ozzie Guillen. One year more recently than Bruce Bochy, who just went to the Texas Rangers, and only one year less recently than Joe Madden, who obviously in this town is still trumpeted for recently winning a World Series. So how recent uh, is recent? You can define yourself, but. Those are all uh, mathematical truths. Right. So if the staff has some overturn here and he has spots to fill, uh, looking at the experience um, that he does have in Kansas City, um, in 2015 when they were uh, World Series championship uh, champions, he was the uh, coaching catch of the Royals uh, from 2014 to 2017. Um, he does have some managerial experience as well in the Venezuelan Winter League as the manager of the Lara Cardinals. Um, also in 2012, he was the manager of the High, uh, High Desert Mavericks. Um, also in 2013, he was the hitting coach for the surprise rookie ball team down in Kansas City or for Kansas City now. Uh, then in 2013, he was a special coach assignment for Kansas City. In 2013-2014, took over as the hitting coach for uh, George Brett for the Royals. Again, catching coach uh, in 2014-2017. Uh, took on quality control as well from 2018-2019 for the Royals. Was a manager in Lidom uh, for the uh, Cubalo uh, Gigantes. I tried to listen to a, a Interview did not nail that pronunciation there. Sean, uh, not a big, the Sean, coach. not a big watcher of Sabado Gigante, obviously. No, and you did that way better than I. I should have had you say that. Tom <laughs> Francisco. In 2019, Tom 2022, yeah. uh, was the bench coach for the Royals. Um, so maybe the winning experience comes in a bench coach. And there was the report that Charlie Montoyo uh, might be the next bench coach under uh, under Pedro Griefel. How important is that bench coach? And ha- does that bench coach having managerial experience or prior managerial experience matter? I'll go with Josh because he's. <laughs> yeah, his so hand here. Please. <laughs> with the with the bench coach, I think some of the conversations in game, like how should we go about the decision making here when you're going from the fifth to sixth inning and you're having that conversation along with Ethan Katz and Mentoya, should we leave like let's say Lucas Giolito's on the mound? Should we leave Giolito for how many batters here? Or when do we want to make changes? Who do we want to bring up guys to the bullpen? Let's look at the bench. If Andrew Vaughn gets on base, when do we get a pinch runner ready for him? And do we have Gavin Sheets ready to fill in at first base? I, I think in game decision making is where the bench coach is is going to help. Preparing for a game, I mean, Pedro Griefel has been helping the Royals prepare for games, so he should have that type of experience already, and he's probably got ideas on how he would prepare for a game because he's been helping Mike Matheny prepare for games, Mm -hmm. and I'm sure that is a very, let's say, unique experience, helping Mike Matheny prepare for games with the Kansas City Royals, maybe they butted heads, and we didn't know about that until... Yeah, Matheny's like, hey, let's bunt every time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, the analytics, schmatic, you know, get rid of that. We'll we'll bunt guys over to second base when they get on first. It's one of my favorites. But uh, with Mentoya, I think if he, if he is hired as the bench coach, he's got that recent experience, and he can help with the in-game decision-making. 
I know there's a lot of focus on hitting coaches right now and who would be a good hitting coach for the White Sox. I don't have a really good answer for that. I think Chris Johnson is the hitting coach for the Charlotte Knights. They could go that route again, but I do advise everyone. Frank Menachino was also the hitting coach for the Charlotte Knights. And thanks to Baseball America doing the park factors in minor league baseball, the easiest stadium to hit in all of minor league baseball is Charlotte. Do not believe the numbers in Charlotte from the White Sox prospects. Take the home splits, throw them in the garbage, and look at the road splits. And if they hit on the road, yes, they are good. Amazingly, 330-foot pop flies in Charlotte leave the ballpark. Uh, So it gives you a false impression on just how well hitters are hitting in Charlotte. But But Josh, Gavin Sheets started going the other way. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. One name I will bring up, because the White Sox are very confident that he will be a good coach, is Jim Tomey. Don't be surprised if his name gets involved, because he's been the roving hitting instructor within the Chicago White Sox organization. I don't hate that idea, Vinny, because it's Jim Tomey. The dude hit more than 500 home runs, and we've talked about for years as White Sox fans, man, Frank Thomas would be an awesome hitting coach, because when he talks about hitting, When he's on Fox or NBC Sports Chicago, you stop and listen because this is a Hall of Famer talking about the art of hitting a baseball. And he's one of the best hitters of all time, especially for the Chicago White Sox organization. And Jim Tomey was also awesome at hitting. And if he's already working with Andrew Vaughn and trying to get more into the power of his swing and he's helping other hitters as well for the White Sox, if they want to try somebody new as the hitting coach... I guess, why not Jim Tomey? He's there in spring training every year working with these guys. Uh, you know, I, I don't think um, I don't think it's a bad name to include on the list. The, the reasonings you gave there are uh, quite sound, but uh, we'll see. He's, he's been a special assistant in the front office as well um, and then has broadcast responsibilities of his own over at MLB Network. Maybe he's loving life and doesn't necessarily want to uh, uh, add a 162-game uh, baseball schedule to his plate, but uh, he's a... Uh, He's a, as about as enthusiastic as a person that you could find. And if uh, I've talked to him on the phone about, about Andrew Vaughn in the past and just, you know, minutes and minutes worth of how phenomenal Andrew Vaughn's going to be. So uh, it's it's possible, certainly. But I think you want somebody who um, is, is able to do that kind of targeted work with everybody on the roster. Right. And I'm not saying Jim can't do that, obviously. But uh, being brought in to tutor one specific player because maybe he is showing signs of being the kind of hitter that Jim Tomey was in his career, uh, you know, maybe that was just a, a, a perfect match. Uh, you need somebody, I think, as I tried to uh, kind of explain all year, it's not the hitting coach is saying one thing and every player on the team needs to follow that one rule. Mm-hmm. And the, uh, It's a team-wide thing that everybody needs to hit exactly the same. They need a, hit, uh, a hitting coach who's going to identify the strengths of each and every player on that team. What works for Tim Anderson might not work for Yoan Moncada. What works for Luis Robert might not work for Andrew Vaughn. They need somebody who knows that and can and can go and do that job one by one. The only problem I have with Jim Tomey is the problem I have with most players who know how to hit and hit home runs is that they don't know how to teach that to other people. That's a good point. That's the only thing. Like, you saw Barry Bonds go down there to Miami. The Marlins weren't, like, better. <laughs> you Same. know who was his assistant hitting coach? Huh. Frank Menachino. Uh, he's like, <laughs> don't pay attention to what that garbage guy is saying. Hit singles. Um, you know, Mark McGuire, he had a hitting coach job or two. Hasn't uh, translated. The people that you know are hitting coaches, like Walt Reniak, somebody brought up, those are few and far between. And I don't, you know, we had a discussion like a couple of weeks ago. I don't know how much hitting coaches actually do at the major league level. By that time, you're pretty much established. Like Kevin Long, he has a track record of things that he's done and people that swear by his methods. That's one of 30. I don't know if there's a good hitting coach prospect out there for the White Sox to get, and that changes their fortunes where they're hitting balls over the fence again. We'll get into it. If if you have more, we'll get into it in a second. Uh, Because I think I have an idea, and and maybe it's another one that I'll strike out and miss on. Uh, So we'll see. Uh, Four strikes, you're out? Four strikes, you're out. Um, Unheard of. Doug Edding's behind the plate. (laughs) I'm going for that golden sombrero. It's it's really nice and gold. Um, Jaxo23 has a super chat for us, and then we're going to hit an ad break. Charlie Montoyo is our bench coach, and the start of the 2023 schedule has me upset. Uh, (laughs) Hate to hear it. Uh, But uh, uh, we did get some... uh, 
follow up from KPW, our fellow Torontan, uh, who had to deal with Charlie Montoyo at his, as his manager this year. Uh, as a guy whose team fired Charlie this season, Charlie is great players guy. Strategically, he's hit and miss. Maybe, uh, and what we're trying to show with uh, you know Griffol's resume is he's got a lot of experience doing everything, and a lot of it is doing that strategy side of it. So maybe in the in-game moments where Charlie's been, what he's done before can hopefully help Griefel. Um It's an interesting name, and I do like the fact that he has managerial experience. It hasn't been confirmed yet, though, so maybe you don't have to be too upset. Jack, and all so. the little things, too, that maybe Griefel, like, because this be his first time actually being a bench boss in the major leagues, like full-time. The little things that you might forget because you're just watching a game from that normal vantage point that he's been for the last 10 years. Uh, uh, Charlie Montoya might say, hey, look ahead a couple of innings. This is the third inning, but you need to look into the sixth inning, man. That hitter right there, he plays very well versus your our pitcher right there. Maybe the third time around for Luke Steele is not the thing we should have here. Maybe we should be going to a person earlier in the game. And I hope his analytics uh, uh, knowledge for uh, Griefel will allow him to put in pitchers who – some people would save until the seventh, eighth, or ninth inning. So if it's the seventh inning and Kendall Graven's not available and Joe Kelly's not available and it's time for Liam Hendricks to shut down the three, four, and five, the seventh thing, I have no problem with him bringing in Liam Hendricks right then for two innings and then go with uh, Reynaldo Lopez for the save right there instead of just going to a generic pitcher in the seventh inning because you got to follow the same boring formula when the game is on the balance right there in the seventh inning, you might not get to Liam Hendricks in the ninth inning because you've given up runs before you got a chance to get them. So I hope Pedro Griefel has an open mind about using his, his relievers in different roles, not just having them static. It's like, okay, I can only use Liam for the ninth. Well, and if you have a closed mind on meats, uh, maybe you should have an open mind because Greenridge Farm is a Chicago local mm. meat and cheese com uh, mm. company. Uh, that was for questionable. You. Hey, that didn't work. Hey, I said we were going into an ad read, and then Herb <laughs> gave his thoughts on Pedro Griefel's analytics. Uh, so I, I'm I, sorry. I just had to, you're all good. I just had to <laughs> wedge it in there. Uh, Greenridge Farm is a Chicago local meat and cheese company offering you a better all-natural option. They're perfect for tailgating, which is why they are sponsoring and will be sending over products to our CHGO Bears tailgate on November. 6th. If you want to come hang out with us, make sure you check out the link in the description or head to allchgo.com to buy tickets to our tailgate. But if you come out to the tailgate, you get to try all the great Green Ridge, uh, Green Ridge Farms meat products. Um, they have great meat sticks. So you'll be able to try the chicken, the black forest beef, the jalapeno cheddar, the spicy chili ones. They got fantastic deli meat as well. You'll be able to try their fantastic cheeses. So head out on November 6th. Come to the All CHGO tailgate for the Bears Dolphins game. It's about a 15 minute walk from Soldier Field as well. We have parking there. Um, there's upgraded parking uh, on that when you buy tickets. So if you're looking for a spot to park, hang out and then walk over to the Bears game, uh, come check out the tailgate and try some Green Ridge Farms uh, because it's simply naturally meat. Uh, right now, when you order any three meat products at GreenRidgeFarm.com and include a pack of meat sticks in your cart, those meat sticks will be free simply by using code CHGO at checkout. Again, when you order any three meat products at GreenRidgeFarm.com and include a pack of meat sticks in your cart, those meat sticks will be free simply by using code CHGO at checkout. Again, Green Ridge Farm, simply natural meat. And then our next partner is ComEd, and we're very excited to have them powering us. ComEd Energy Efficiency Program is committed to helping families and business in the communities we serve save money and energy. ComEd offers free assessment uh, facility assessments that can find energy-saving opportunities, whether it's lighting, HVAC systems, commercial kitchen equipment, or industrial processes. An authorized engineer will work with you to develop a detailed assessment plan specific to your goals and needs. They can be done in person or virtually and last approximately two hours. Within three to four weeks, customers will receive a report detailing energy efficiency projects that can help them start or that they can start working on immediately. Each recommendation will include estimated energy savings, cost savings, project costs, potential incentives, and simple payback paybacks. So don't wait, get started saving money and energy today for energy saving tips and to schedule your free facility assessment, go to comed.com slash powering biz. That's comed.com slash powering B I Z. And if you're ready to sign up for a facility facility assessment, call us at one 855 433-2700 during normal business hours to speak with a ComEd ed energy efficient program representative or email businessee at comed.com. So my idea, Tony LaRusso was making about $4 million, which is 
fairly hefty for a, for a manager. Yes. Pedro Grifo with no managerial experience, probably not going to cost $4 million. Nope. Could the White Sox, who clearly see Ethan Katz as the next or their next pitching coach, can they make the same or a similar investment or increased investment into a guy like Kevin Long? Kevin Long was on the Joe Girardi staff for the Phillies. I don't know what his relationship is with the current managers of the Phillies. If they go out and make a godfather offer to Kevin Long and say, we think you're the best hitting coach in the major leagues. You can prove it with your four different titles uh, You know, over the past 10 years with four different teams. Come and be our hitting coach and work with this great talent because the Phillies have great talent. They're the White Sox of the uh, National League, as we usually say, Herb. So why not just go out and get the best guy? I don't think Philly would let him go. I think he's under contract for a decent amount of time. There would be no reason for them to let him go. Um, but I don't know if he wants to be a hitting coach out of, after this job. He deserves a manager spot. So I think it's just unrealistic for him to come here to the White Sox, no matter how much money they would be offering him. And then secondly, the Phillies are probably in love with him and want to offer him much more money than he's getting right now. Yeah, Speaking with people that are in Houston for the World Series, for games one and two, getting the chance to chat with Kevin Long, he really wanted a managerial gig. Like, he probably really wanted this job, mm -hmm. and he didn't get it. And he's been a hitting coach... Or four teams, yeah, Yankees, Mets, Mets, Nationals, and now the Phillies. To Herbie's point, I don't know if he wants to be a hitting coach. I don't know if it's the White Sox way to spend money at the top level and, I don't know, pay a hitting coach a million dollars a season. Like, would they do that? I don't know. Now, I like the idea of how they gave Todd Steerson, like, hitting coach slash, like, the, his whole hitting system would go filter down the whole system I maybe would get a Kevin Long lieutenant, a guy that he's known for a long time that maybe can teach the same things that Kevin Long can do to be the hitting coach, and then that guy can have his uh, system filtered down. I don't know if he has di uh, disciples underneath him, but I would love to get him because I don't think Kevin Long would be available for the White Sox. If he is, hell yeah, throw all the money in the world at him. I mean, if you have an issue with hitting coach, haven't been able to solve it, why not go get the guy to solve it? I I don't know. It just makes sense. I, I if they're not going to make you know investments on the field, which I know they they have and haven't uh, in ways that fans have liked and haven't liked. You know they wanted them to go get Manny Machado, they didn't, but they got Liam Hendricks. Um, but they haven't. You know it's just a hitting coach. You know it's it's they paid Leary Garcia five million dollars a year. I, I would imagine that Pedro Grifo will have a lot to say about this as well. I mean, I think what we right. heard from Rick Hahn at the end of the season was not going to comment on any of the coaching staff because the manager is going to have a lot of say in, in who in who he wants around him. So um, you can draft up your list of uh, you know to to have a uh, fantasy draft of assistant coaches from around baseball. But I think uh, the the person probably with the most say in the matter is going to be the new manager. Oh, okay. yeah. He's so, staying. He's looking up hit, hitting coach contracts over there. Yeah, Steven Alexander. My goodness. Okay. So okay. Steven said off mic. Uh, you sounded clear to me. Um, Steven said that Kevin Long has a team option for 2023. Um, I didn't know that Spot Rack had hitting yeah. coaches contracts. Inquirer.com. Inquirer oh, Philly, Philly Inquirer. Inquirer. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I think Griefall will have his say in, in hitting coach and, and the staff around him. I don't know what the hitting coach or who the hitting coach might be. Um, I do see Carlos Beltran in the, the comments there. Uh, Raul Abanez does have a, a Royals connection. I was looking up Pedro Grifo on Twitter, and Raul Abanez was uh, mentioning him a lot on Twitter. So I don't know if that relationship is strong enough or if Raul doesn't like the, the MLB front office, but maybe Abanez is a guy. I love listening to Raul Abanez, so yeah, bring him by. He's awesome. Like he had a couple interviews um, on the score when I used to work there, and he was just so baseball-y and explaining the game ex not and not dumbing it down for just the regular people talking baseball you know so you can get up to his level and I love that when people do that and so if Raul Abanez is interested in being a future bench boss or a uh, manager or a GM or somewhere I think cutting his teeth with the White Sox as hitting coach would be a perfect start for him especially this team like there would be no hitting coach or a person that is a hitting coach that wouldn't love the talent that's there for the White Sox and seeing where they were in 2022 and all you got to do is have them hit the ball of the fence and I think most people are like hey look at this hitting coach out here doing work 
And, you know, he'll get credit for something that probably was going to happen any, anyways. Well, I want to ask this then. Are we surprised that the White Sox were the last to fill this job? We did talk to Robert Murray, a fan side, and he said it was the most attractive job out there. So now that the White Sox were the last to fill this position with Pedro Grifo, did it seem like it was the most attractive job out there? Or was it just, you know, Bruce Bochy was such a fit in Texas and this was just such a fit for the White Sox. What do we make of the process now that it is, you know, quote unquote over? I would argue against what Robert said about the most attractive job with the Chicago White Sox. In 2023, it's such an important season because you start losing players after this upcoming season. Giolito's a free agent. Mm -hmm. Grandal's a free agent. After 2024, Tim Anderson is a free agent. You can get out of the contracts of Aloy Jimenez and Yohan Makata. Mm. This job, even though a lot of White Sox fans did not want a first-time manager, this job in a way, screamed first-time manager. And it reminds me of what the situation David Ross walked into with the Chicago Cubs. He arrives to the Cubs to try to make the most of this core to have one more postseason run. They have it in 2020. They fail in the postseason against the Marlins. Then the Cubs go with their reload or rebuild or whatever they're calling it right now, where they have a bad 2021 and they have a bad 2022 that is in the realm of possibility for the Chicago White Sox in 2024, 2025, because the next wave of talent that's coming is still kind of stuck in Winston-Salem and Birmingham. They're not in Birmingham and Charlotte right now. They need another year, maybe two years, to start building this next wave of talent to help out in Chicago. So Griefel may have these heavy expectations in 2023 that we're trying to win the American League Central and win some playoff games. I don't know what the outlook is in 2024 and 2025 with this White Sox organization. It's pretty hazy. So that's why I would say it's not the most attractive job. The Texas Rangers job, I thought, was more attractive because there's one thing to say the White Sox have a top 10 payroll, hmm. and it's another thing when the Rangers spend a half a billion dollars on the middle infield, and it's like, well... If you got all this cash, who else are we going to be signing? And it sounds like that they're going to be going after uh, ex-White Sox and uh, old friend Carlos Rodon uh, this upcoming offseason along with a, a bunch of teams. So cool. I, maybe they'll finish third. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> it, 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 is, it is a tough thing. You know, honestly, though, I mean, if the White Sox were in the American League West or East, we're talking about a fourth or fifth place team. Not wrong. Uh, I mean, the, the reason why we're still hopeful about the White Sox making the postseason in 2023 is just the weakness of the American League Central. And there are no super teams in this division. There's really no excuse why the White Sox can't be that super team. They spent all these years to build a super team. And then unfortunately, 2022 happened. But there are some things that are coming on the horizon for the Chicago White Sox that they have to, someone's got to keep an eye on. But I think for most of this organization, for this upcoming season, they're really going to hyper-focus on 2023 it's not that they're ignoring 2024 or 2025, but how 2023 goes greatly determines how those two next, uh, ne the next two seasons go. Well, and I think, you know, I, I think it'd be ridiculous to put expectations on Pedro Griefall as the guy who's going to turn this all around from 2022. That being said, you shouldn't have any different level of expectations for this White Sox team. And the stakes are just as high for first-time manager Pedro Griefel as they were for three-time World Series winner and Hall of Famer Tony La Russa. Yes. This team is supposed to win the World Series. And in on one hand, that's exciting for Pedro Griefel probably because he could step into a situation where he could be First time managing in the big leagues, and he is managing a contending team, going from being the bench coach for the Royals to the manager of a team that could contend for the World Series. But the flip side is, hey, buddy, you know, uh, you know, a lot of people when they're first time managers or even second time managers, as we saw with Ricky Renneria, you know, you're going to get some time to build this, to build this thing, to be with us for the long haul. It's not the case for Pedro Griefel. Not saying that he's not going to be here for a long time. I'm saying that his expectation level is, okay, you got your job, congratulations, go win the World Series. Well, and like Josh was saying, we're not sure what to expect for the 2024 or 2025 team, but Rick Hahn said in his postseason press conference that they need to win the fans' trust back. And 
how you do that is by winning, right? Right. Then he followed that up with the trade market would be more fruitful than free agency. That was not a good press conference for Rick Hahn and his attempt to begin the process of getting the trust back from White Sox fans. These are two different conversations. I mean, right now we're talking about the new manager and we're cautiously optimistic. If you want to start talking about this upcoming offseason and what this front office is going to do, it is a complete 180 on how White Sox fans view this upcoming offseason compared to the hiring process. Maybe the hiring process gives hope that they're going to be open to new ideas, but now all of the questions shift from, okay, Pedro Grifo is the new manager. Cool. What are we going to do with this roster? Because it's all about change, right? I mean, the whole yes. the whole end, there might not, as we've talked about a million times, there might not be a lot of ways to change this roster from the actual people on it, right? But it is all about, okay, 2022, that was no good. You just stood up there and said, Rick Hahn, that it was the most disappointing season of your career. So how are we going to make sure that doesn't happen again? Right. And and the first thing that they've done is hired a manager from outside the organization who could bring in some new ideas and some fresh perspective. But now they've got to go about making the tweaks that they can, and it might not be a lot of them, but the tweaks that they can to this roster to put to put Griefel in a in a position to have success and to put everybody else on the team in a position to have success as well. And that, and that's why the people at SoxMachine.com have the offseason project plan, uh, which is why they try yeah. to figure out the offseason for the 2022 20- 2023 White Sox and what this 26 man team will look like for the 2023 season. So we'll get into that with Josh and his plan and what this team might look like if Josh Nelson was the GM. Um, <laughs> if, if Josh Nelson had all the trust in the world and had uh, the, his druthers, uh, what would he spend it on? So first, let's tell you about Game Time. They are the hottest new ticketing site that makes it easier than ever to score the best deals on tickets to sports, concerts, and shows. The biggest last minute price drops can be found on seats you never thought you could buy. So if you're at the CHGO Paris tailgate and you really want to go to the Bears Dolphin game this is the best place to buy your tickets if you're looking to go I think the Blackhawks are at home tonight if you're looking to go just down the block to the UC you can go to game time and buy your tickets there you won't find a better deal this season on Bears Bulls Blackhawks tickets than on game time it was created by the fans for the fans and as Herb knows it guarantee the lowest price possible if you find a better seat on a different site which you might not um if you do, and contact Game Time, they'll give you 110% of your money back in Game Time credits that you could spend on another great concert or event or game that you want to go to. So if you love CHGO, then you'll love Game Time. The best way to support us is by buying your tickets to the link in the description. Join over 15 million people who have downloaded the Game Time app and scored the best seats to all your favorite events. When we were doing CHGO bets earlier, there was nasty sun shining into Studio B, and I needed my Shady Rays very badly. Shady Rays never understood why sunglasses were so expensive, so they set out to change it. You don't have to break the bank for quality sunglasses this fall because our friends at Shady Rays has you covered. Shady Rays are premium polarized shades featuring world-class optical clarity, substantial durability, and styles carried to everyone and everyone's lifestyle. Um, Shady Rays has over 200 thousand five-star reviews and even with a great protection plan where if you break it on day one they still make quality sunglasses that when you hold them in your hand they feel just like the expensive pair that herb hair has and the thing is exclusively for our listeners shady rays is running their deepest deal of the season use code chgo for 50 percent off two or more pairs at shadyrays.com buy one get one free you can get two pairs for as low as 54 dollars again buy one get one free at shadyrays.com where you can find all their newest and best shades finally got to mention you uh, got to let you know about foco we brought up the dallas keiko gold glove bobblehead um, if you're looking for the dallas keiko gold glove bobblehead head over to foco chicago you already got the best coverage for your favorite team so get fitted in the best sports gear around foco you've got foco has you covered from soldier field to the living room north or south side with hoodies slipper signs bobbleheads and everything in between get decked out like demar with apparel from the leaders in sports merch and collectibles foco if you're looking for the perfect gift for the football fan in your life foco's got you covered with hoodies to fight that lake michigan breeze so check out foco.com that's foco.com or click the link in the description below and for all non-presale items use the promo code chgo for 10 percent off uh, herb i think you mentioned uh, the idea of uh, the white Sox hiring robin uh, robin uh, ventura is kind of similar to mike Matheny. Uh, on SoxMachine.com, Josh, uh, your buddy, Jim Margulis, described it as the churchier version of that, yes. which I love. So if you're looking for some great Sox coverage, uh, <laughs> check out SoxMachine.com. Uh, but you guys start the offseason 
uh, plan project. So what's that like? How long you guys been doing that for? And uh, if you want to give basically the rundown of what you guys tried to do um, and what fans can do, um, you know, why not? Yeah, so the off-season plan project on SoxMachine.com, it allows the fans to step in as the White Sox GM. So you have to make the same decisions that Rick Hahn has to make. And some of these decisions are going to have to be made within 10 days of the World Series ending, uh, or one key decision with A.J. Pollock's player option is going to be made for you within 10 days of the World Series ending. So some of these decisions are going to be coming down the pipe, but you have to decide on the arbitration eligible players who you're going to be tendering contracts to, who are you going to be non-tendering, which club options you're going to pick up, the player option, how it impacts you, and then with a budget, that's when you get creative. What free agents would you sign, and how much would you sign them for? What kind of trades would you be making in your off-season plan project with the goal to build a 26-man roster that fits the budget that will be better in 2023 than in 2022? large ask because um, we thought there was you know such high expectations for the 2022 team and we don't even know what this budget might look like which I think is my biggest question when doing this project plan um, and you made some interesting trades so let's go through uh, your plan here um, sure. you could read this on SoxMachine.com we'll go to the arg- arbitration eligible players first uh, Lucas Giolito, Dylan Cease, Ronaldo Lopez, Adam Ingo, Michael Kopech, Kyle Crick, Jose Ruiz, Danny Mendick you all have to make the decision on these players um, what was the biggest one or the toughest one because it's seems like Giolito, Cease, Reynaldo, Michael Kopech are easier ones. Um, yeah. But what were some of the tougher ones? The Jose Ruiz and Danny Mendick, these are toss-ups. Mm-hmm. And I could understand how the White Sox walk away because they like their internal options. The Danny Mendick situation, I mean, you got Romy Gonzalez, you got Lenin Sosa, you got Yobert Sanchez. So if you decide to walk away from Danny Mendick, you can go with those three to help out with the super utility the thing about Jose Ruiz, and I know a lot of White Sox fans roll their eyes when they, when, he, when they see Ruiz enter the game. For someone that goes in mop-up duty, $1 million mm-hmm. is not expensive mm-hmm. for like the eighth guy in your bullpen. So that's why I tendered a contract with Ruiz. And Danny Mendick, he played so well, Vinny, before that collision against Adam Hazley. He had an OPS over 800. That's Adam Purple Hazley, by the way. Adam Purple yeah. Hazley. <laughs> and... Just getting knocked out was just super unfortunate for Danny Mendick because I think he was it was finally clicking for him. He was finally figuring it out. A million dollars is not a lot of money. I think you tender him a contract and see what he could provide. If he bounces back from that torn ACL and he could be that super utility, I trust Danny Mendick more to handle second or shortstop than I do Lurie Garcia. Uh, so that's why I decided to tender uh, Danny Mendick, a contract. No offense to Kyle Crick. I totally forgot that he was still on the White Sox. <laughs> so that's why I non-tendered him. And Adam Engel, you know, man, it's been a great run. Uh, 2017 was super rough with the bat. And obviously he had the amazing defensive highlights. But I thought, this guy is not long for the major leagues. We're still talking about Adam Engel in 2022. And the fact that he's had this type of career for him in the majors, now he's running into the situation where a lot of major leaguers run into. Now you're arbitration eligible. Booyah, I'm going to start making millions of dollars. And the team's like, uh, for what you do, that's too much money. We're going to move on. And you're going to be in this quadruple A state. A, a, a old friend, Yomer Sanchez, is still in this quadruple A state, moving between triple A and the major leagues. I think Adam Engel will still sign on with another team in the major leagues, but I, I view the rest of his career bouncing back between triple A and the majors, but that's too much money for a fourth outfielder. Yeah, I mean, Adam Engel, after the All-Star break, break, only played 51 games, started in 18 of them, and it really felt like it just kind of uh, – started rolling down the hill for him after he dropped that ball in Baltimore and that game started getting out of hand. So yeah, I'm with you on Ingle. The Ruiz one is tough, but he's thrown, uh, he's like top 35 innings in the past two, th- three years, like uh, 125 innings. He's thrown more innings than Edwin Diaz. Um, like yes. he's, he's been used as much as Andrew Chafin who gets about $6 million. So I- I'm with you. Like I-, I see a lot of people and a lot of fans submitting these to SoxMachine.com and they're saying non-tender Jose Ruiz. And I'm like, eh, not so fast, my friend. He's cheap. That's why you tend right. <laughs> he's cheap and he's, you he's one big. Of, you need one of those guys in the bullpen. You, you need do. multiple guys in the bullpen that can do what Jose Ruiz can do. Any disagreement here, Vinny and Herb, on Mendick or Ingle? I mean, it seems 
it seems clear outside of, I think, Jose Ruiz to me. I'm 100% bringing Mendick back because of what he did before he got injured. I think that he's progressing, and while most people's uh, progression is not linear and uh, how they learn how to play baseball and how they fit into the lineup isn't, like, singular progressive, he is finding a way to go up every year and impress every year. Do the different things. Okay, cool, you got me in a shortstop. I'm playing a little bit for Tim. Cool, I'll give you what I can get for you. If you need a power bat, I can I can hit the ball out of the ballpark every once in a while. I just see him as a perfect fifth infielder for any major league team that is contending because he knows his role and he doesn't want to do too much. He's not going to complain a little, a lot, and his money is inexpensive. So, yeah, that was a automatic tender for me, for him. Yeah, and Kyle Crick, I know he has filthy stuff, but can he get that filthy stuff oh, over the plate? Yeah. No. 1.5, and I think he left with uh, elbow inflammation. So what is his even state at? You know, how healthy is he? A lot of questions with Kyle Crick. If they brought him back for, you know, league minimum or uh, $1 million, I wouldn't hate it. But 1.5, I, I definitely understand why the non-tender was chosen there. Club options, Tim Anderson. Uh, Melissa says socks like cheap. So Tim Anderson at, 12, likes cheap. at $12.5 million <laughs> seems pretty cheap. Josh Harrison, though, that's a big one for us. Uh, Herb, I don't know where you stand. Pick up or decline? decline I think he did well for this year that he had here in Chicago but I as Josh said we have a bunch of second base options out there if we're gonna go cheap and we're gonna spend that money elsewhere I think you're gonna get as good of play combined offensively and defensively from one of those four guys they have in their system don't have to pay Josh Harrison that much money. And Vinny, you saw, talked about it like earlier. You had a, 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 a article earlier this offseason talking about Josh Harrison. Second base seems like the one spot they could probably upgrade. Yeah, I mean, I think from a bringing in somebody else to 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 add something new and different to this lineup, second base looks like the place to do that. That being said, it's not going to be easy to go find that guy. I mean, Josh Harrison's numbers were not great this year. And so do you? can you find that production somewhere else? Sure. Am I looking at the list of White Sox minor league middle infielders and going, there's the starting second baseman? No, I'm not. I don't think that if you go into opening day with Romy Gonzalez, no offense to Romy Gonzalez, I don't think people are going to be jazzed about that situation. Um, it, uh, but you know what? I said the same thing about Josh Harrison when they signed Josh Harrison. And then he had a season that was not really worth getting jazzed about. So um, I think it is, I think it totally makes sense from a roster move standpoint. If you're going to be able to, you know, find anywhere to budge and get somebody else in here, it's going to be second base. But that being said, it could be a risky decision for Rick Hahn because are you going to be able to go out and assure that you're going to get somebody that much better than Josh Harrison? We've seen the free agent list; it's not thrilling. And <laughs> and if there's a trade, and if there's a trade to be made, who knows if you've got what it takes to go get that guy? I know one guy who doesn't want uh, Josh Harrison to return. He's closing the door right now. Our producer, Stephen Nicholas. <laughs> well, Josh, why don't you tell us about uh, NL Central tycoon Colton Wong, who might be uh, replacing Josh Harrison if you had your druthers. Yeah, so when it came to my creativity, like what, I, what would I do at free agency and trades? One name that I'm targeting is Colton Wong. Colton Wong currently has a $10 million club option with the Milwaukee Brewers. They just had a front office change and there's a $2 million buyout. The Milwaukee Brewers are thrilled with Luis Arias, and they have Bryce Terrain and AAA that they're also very fond of and believe that either one of those guys could fill in at second base, and they can spend that $10 million elsewhere to help improve the roster. So I think Colton Wan is going to be bought out shortly after the World Series and becoming a free agent. The way I look at it is that he signed a two-year, $20 million deal with the Milwaukee Brewers. I think that's a very fair deal and something that the Chicago White Sox can actually afford is to sign Colton Wan to be their second baseman. One bad thing, he had 17 errors this past year. That is a bit alarming because the previous two years, he only had two for the entire season. Mm. He has won multiple gold gloves, so there's a bit of a question on what exactly happened defensively for Colton Wan, when you look at baseball savant, he was nine runs below average charging in on ground balls. So maybe some better practice, maybe Pedro Griefel could help defensively here to help Colton Wan get back to the gold glove level that he was with the St. Louis Cardinals and briefly with the Milwaukee Brewers. But Colton Wan bats left-handed. 
And one thing Cole Wan does is that he bashes right-handed pitching with an OPS over 800. That is exactly what the Chicago White Sox need from the second base position. Romy Gonzalez, bats right-handed. Lenin Sosa, bats right-handed. That doesn't help the White Sox problem against right-handed pitching. So I would like Cole Wan to join the White Sox be that second baseman. I think that's a very interesting and sneaky good defensive up the middle between Tim Anderson and Cole Wan, especially if Wan can iron out some of the defensive problems that he had in 2022. And he's been hitting really well if you look at his WRC plus the last couple of years. I know he's 32 years old, but something's clicking here offensively. Guarantee rate field is a great ballpark for left-handed hitters. Just ask Gavin Sheets. That is, I think, the best of the free agent targets for the Chicago White Sox that I think is realistic for them. There's a lot of White Sox fans pounding the table for Brandon Nemo. Brandon Nemo is going to get paid. (laughs) Okay, we're talking five years, more than $120 million that he's going to be receiving. He is going to get paid. The team that loses out on Aaron Judge in the sweepstakes is going to immediately turn around and go after Brandon Nemo. He might get too expensive for the White Sox. I don't discredit the idea. I think it's a great idea. He would be a great addition. I just think he'll be too expensive for the White Sox. So Colton Wong, 17 errors for the Brewers last year? Snatch your White Sox. Yeah, he's Exactly. He's like, he's already <laughs> part of the organization. Yes, already part of the organization, <laughs> already making errors. And that's the thing with second base, though. Like, I, I feel a little bit annoyed just because you're declining Josh Harrison, who's a better player than Leary Garcia, and Leary Garcia is making about you know $10 million over the next two years. I would just like them to eat the Leary cash um, and then have Harrison and, and Colton Wong. That'd There's be great. two more years. Two they, years of eating They it. screwed up. Make, make, make that mistake go away. Um, I understand it's it's sunk cash and it's sunk money, but damn it, that's a lot of money. Leary <laughs> has has value. Not a lot, yeah. but he has value still to your major league team that he can do some things. If you play him right, if the White Sox play him as a fifth infielder slash fourth outfielder, he's the perfect player. Otherwise, if he's playing all the goddamn time, then you get exposed and people hate Larry <laughs> Garcia. <laughs> we don't need 80. For him, like, it's like we always blame him, and I'm, you know, hater number one. I always blame him for being bad at baseball. It's like, Hey, this is how this I'm giving maximum effort. They played me here. I didn't play myself. It's their fault. They play me so much. And they gave me money. What am I supposed to sign the contract? (laughs) He tries tries so hard. He's always sliding into first base. Come on. (laughs) I didn't ask for 89 games starting at second base. Yeah. Um, but yeah, with second base, it's really like you're either a great hitter or a poor fielder, or you're just kind of in the middle, yeah. or you're a great fielder or a horrible hitter like Cesar Hernandez. Um, the one thing with Griefel, you mentioned it too, like uh, on charging ground balls, the one thing that I saw going around today on Twitter was the the snapshot of one article where um, Griefel was you know looking into framing metrics and, and looking into the formulas themselves and going to conferences and trying to figure out how to improve Perez's framing numbers. So maybe that part is part of the research that he's done and and could bring to the White Sox to help it at least improve the uh, outs above average grades that the White Sox have. Um, so that would maybe be the one hope uh, there. I do like the trade that you also uh, bring up. Well, actually, I want to go to Nimmo first. Paying him $23 million with you declining Jose Abreu's $18 million, does that not free up enough money for the Sox to go sign a $100 million player this offseason? That's a good question. When I... After all the decisions made before getting to free agency and trades, we put the off-season plan budget at $190 million, which is pretty high. I'm already at $171 million because all the money that is quote-unquote saved from not re-signing Jose Abreu quickly disappears with the arbitration contracts of Dylan Cease, Lucas Giolito, Michael Kopech, and the pay raise is going to Tim Anderson, Yohan Makata, Eloy Jimenez, and Luis Robert. That money is gone from Jose Abreu. It's already spent with the the pay raises. So for me, I only had $19 million left. So if I was going to be bringing in Brandon Nemo, that'd be the only move. And I would also need to shed payroll to make that move happen. And you needed to shed payroll anyways for some of the moves that you had to. I did. End up trading Liam Hendricks away. Um, First off, why would the Dodgers want to get burned by another White Sox closer? (laughs) Because he's actually good. So this is the (laughs) Dodgers perspective. Oh, yes, we would actually, we want the closer that we actually wanted when we called you. And we just grudgingly on April 1st said, fine, bring over Kimbrell. Just move over at Camelback Ranch. Just walk down the hallway He'll be our closer. And, yeah, that obviously didn't work. 
completely lost the relationship with Dave Robertson or the trust of Dave, Rob, uh, Dave Roberts at the end of the season. The thing about Liam Hendricks is that he's been everything that the White Sox wanted from him when they signed him. Mm -hmm. And he's still an elite closer. 38, 37 saves in back-to-back -back seasons. Still putting up awesome strikeout rates. The thing about Hendricks is that he is the fourth highest paid player for the Chicago White Sox going to the 2023 season. And he plays 4% of the innings during the regular season. Just on principle... That does not make sense to me. And he is like driving a Lamborghini and you are renting with two other roommates. You got a cool car, but you're still paying rent and you still got two roommates in Chicago. That doesn't make sense. You should probably sell the Lamborghini and maybe put that as a down payment for your own home or move out and just have your own apartment because there's better things you could do with that money in your life. Same thing with the White Sox. They could spend that money better on the holes that they have at second base in a right field, and especially starting pitching depth. The Dodgers don't have a lot of holes. They do have a hole in high-leverage situations, and there is a trust issue within the Dodgers and who they're going to hand the ball off in the eighth and ninth inning. So if you have that conversation again with the Dodgers, hey – do you need a closer? We are now willing to move Liam Hendricks. The second year automatically vests. So Hendricks is for two years, $29 million. That's a lot cheaper than Edwin Diaz. Right. Edwin Diaz is going to sign for way more than that. And if you think Hendricks and Diaz are on the same level, okay, what do you need, White Sox? Well, there is quite the log jam for the Los Angeles Dodgers at second base. So pay attention to prospect Michael Bush who had an outstanding AAA season, but you got Gavin Lux and Max Muncy in front of them, and they just signed Muncy to another contract. I don't know if that was in preparation of them walking away from Justin Turner. We'll see how that works out for the Dodgers. But the Dodgers have seven, seven top 100 prospects, and they have multiple pitchers who are in AAA that maybe the White Sox can leverage Liam Hendricks and moving Hendricks for one of those AAA starting pitchers that are in the top 100 that could be in competition for the fifth starter or just help build starting pitching depth. Because if you go to a whiteboard right now and you try to create and look even at the 40-man roster, the White Sox starting pitching depth right now, Sean, is six pitchers. Six. It's Cease, Kopech, Lynn, Giolito, Davis Martin, and we don't know the status or we haven't heard an update since the final game against the Twins on where he is injury-wise, and Sean Burke. Sean Burke pitched in Birmingham. The White Sox don't have enough starting pitchers in their farm system to complete the roster for the Charlotte Knights. If you do not have five starting pitchers you can count on to pitch in AAA, you do not have enough starting pitching depth for the Major League team because six starting pitchers, you're going to have eight or ten guys make starts for you in 2023. So, again, full circle, long rant, Liam Hendricks is a luxury the White Sox cannot afford. They need to move Hendricks, who's still an elite pitcher, an elite closer, and then try to use that $14 million elsewhere and try to get something back that can help address the holes that they have in their roster at second base, right field, or starting pitching. I like the trading from a strength, but Liam Hendricks is our closer. So that means that you either love Raylo or Kendall Graveman as our closer? Which one are you, are you putting into that spot? I would give the ball to Ronaldo Lopez because I think Lopez can hit 100 miles per hour with maximum effort. And as we're seeing in the postseason, hitters are still having a terrible time hitting triple digits. And I think he could excel in that role. Again, this is a, from a place of principle, Herbie. Mm -hmm. what, no Major League Baseball team should be spending $40 million on your bullpen unless you have everything else covered in your roster. Okay. The White Sox spent way too much money on their bullpen. When you have questions at second base, right field, and starting pitching, I say move Hendricks and then spend that $14 million elsewhere. Well, and the number was what, like 27% of their payroll was on the bullpen? And then you mentioned that $13 million is on Liam Hendricks and only 3% of that is used. So how much of the actual bullpen payroll was actually used this year? Like, it's it's just, it's, it's frustrating. Well, Joe Kelly's getting $9 million. Right. Kendall Graveman's getting $8 million. It, it just, Bummer's like, not much, but it's like two point two million. Well, he he's a pay raise this year. It's three and a half million. Okay. Uh, so he his number continues to go up. That's just a lot of money for guys that don't play a lot of baseball for you. Right. I mean that's thirty one million dollars a year payroll, and 
ne- none of those guys are going to play more than 4% of your regular season. That just doesn't make sense to me. So that's why I think you move Liam Hendricks. Teams are going to covet him. They would love to have Liam Hendricks. The White Sox have holes. Find a trade partner. And you address the depth. I mean, even Charlotte, 23 pitchers started for them. Yeah, it's, just, like, <laughs> it's just pathetic. You have to be crazy. In, if you talk to Chris Getz, I think they are a little embarrassed in what happened in Charlotte this year. It's not fair to that team and especially the relievers on that team to be asked to be in this type of role just to survive a triple a regular season. And it's not like the white Sox could call any of those guys because they're all tired because they got to pitch every single day. So I know that obviously the white Sox addressed, addressed it in the major league baseball draft. Let's go pitcher heavy. And I think that is a, a really good idea, but they just, again, there's a gap in their player development. They need more pitchers in triple a, don't be surprised if they sign a lot of guys to minor league contracts to try to fill that void in Charlotte. It'd be nice to see. Um, final word, people were wondering about crochet in the uh, the chat here. We got a lot of crochet popping up. So Vinny. No, I'm going to, uh, no, he's not a starting pitcher. He's not a starting pitcher. If you think he's a starting pitcher, you could also trade him as well. But I think he has the ability to be a Josh Hader type. Let him be that. That's, that's how I feel about it. There's value in that. Garrett, Cro- I, Garrett Crochet thinks he's a starting pitcher, which I suppose right. shouldn't surprise anybody. But uh, yeah, just for the for the the latest on on what his thing is, he's going to prepare to be a starting pitcher. I would not be surprised to see the White Sox uh, do what they did ahead of this season, which is find that they have the he has the most value to them as a bullpen pitcher. I think the the timelines are very different depending on what ends up playing out. If he is going to be a starting pitcher, you're probably not going to see him come back till the middle of next season. If he's going to be a reliever, you could you could if everything goes right with the rehab, see him very early next season, perhaps even by opening. If day. he's going to start, I would assume he'd probably be in the minor leagues to make those starts. He and would try have to, to build yes. build him up. Yeah. But if you see him in the bullpen right off of Tommy John. I don't think he'll ever be a starter yeah, it, again. It, it, it's a terrible situation. This is where COVID really hurts Garrett Crochet because he was going to be a starter for Tennessee. He missed the beginning part of the season. He only appeared in one game through three and a third innings, was hitting triple digits. But the previous season, Tennessee was in was trying to get to the College World Series and they were pitching him out of the bullpen. So all we really have a film of him being a starting pitcher is his freshman year at Tennessee and he was throwing 90-91. We don't know if that elite fastball velocity carries for more than 70 pitches. The only way we would be able to learn that, to your point, Sean, is if he pitched in the minor leagues. And I just, with the White Sox in a win-now situation, I don't think it's with the White Sox if they're going to learn that he's a starting pitcher. Right. And I think, too, with, with uh, no, I'm blanking on the thought that I had. Awesome. Uh, oh, the about the velocity. You said that he was at 91-90 when he was uh, as a starter. Um, even last year, when we or last time we saw him, like it wasn't even that 100, and he had like the most 100 pitches thrown in 2020. Um, mm-hmm. Like You wouldn't even see like 100 from him when he was coming out of the bullpen. And maybe that's part of the injury there, but you do wonder what he actually is even as a bullpen piece because the results are good, but you know what is this body after you know Tommy John? So a lot of question marks with Garrett Crochet will probably have more answers closer to spring training on that. Uh, but we said, Vinny, it was going to be November 8th when they hired a manager. Seems like they hired one yesterday, you know, the, the day after. So uh, a fun episode here with Josh Nelson of Sox Machine. You can follow Josh on Twitter at Sox Machine underscore, underscore Josh. You can follow uh, Jim Margulis, who is the uh, editor-in-chief over there, at Sox Machine on Twitter as well. That's Vinny Duber in the Bulls hat. You can follow him on Twitter at Vinny Duber. He's our CHGO White Sox beat writer. He has an article up uh, on initial thoughts on Pedro Griefel as the manager. So if you're looking for more article and more written work, head over to allchgo.com. That's Herb Lawrence. You can follow him on Twitter at Eckerwall23. He's our CHGO. CHGO White Sox community leader, and I'm Sean Anderson, the host of the CHGO White Sox podcast. You can follow me on Twitter at Sean underscore W underscore Anderson. Thank you to Stephen Nicholas for producing the show and appreciate everyone hanging out in the chat. They got their new manager. We'll talk more about it tomorrow live at 4 p.m. here on the CHGO Sports YouTube channel.